Can you tell me what type of home you have? Do you rent or own it? Own. You own? And the type of structure, is it single family detached, multi-unit townhome? Single family detached. Okay. And do you know an approximate move in, move in date? We moved in in May of 2013. Okay. Have you always lived here in Berrien County? Yep. Okay. Can you tell me how your family ended up living here? Work and family related. Okay. So that's really interesting. Um, I am not originally from Berrien County. Um, I moved here as well um, due to work. So could you tell me more about the kind of house that you live in? Specifically, what are you looking for? Um, maybe where you're located at within the county. Um, what, uh, we're located in the southern, southern part of the county, so south of Nashville. Okay. 2,800 square feet. Okay. Um, it's located on approximately three quarters of an acre. In a subdivision. Okay. What else? Um, I think that's good. Um, in your own words, I'm going to ask you questions about why you did or did not or will or will not adopt rooftop solar for this next short part of the um, interview. Um, so, have you currently invested in solar, either on the roof of your home, on your property, or as part of a business, or through your utility program? The only solar investment we have <clears throat> are a couple of portable wireless lights that light up and, uh, and put light on the front of the house okay. at night, but that, that's it. There's nothing specifically attached to the structure. And those were relatively inexpensive. Okay. So, like, no... No technical rooftop solar. That is correct. Okay. So can you tell me why you do not currently have rooftop solar? Uh, I find it cost inhibitive. Okay. Now, um, another part of that question is, did you make that decision or was it made for you? Uh, I have made that decision. Okay. Uh, also, I am not completely aware of what the state regulations are, especially involving the electrical co-op that I'm, uh, I pay to. I'm, I'm a member of Georgia Power. Okay. They may allow that, but I haven't completely looked into it. <clears throat> it does interest me the idea of having some type of solar method of uh, obtaining electricity via solar energy that would also tie back into the uh, the I guess the, the electrical grid. Okay. So if you had the option, would you put it on your home? I would, yes. I don't know if my wife would like the way it looks. Okay. <clears throat> I know aesthetics can sometimes be an issue, but I would be very interested in something like that if, uh, if something that was economical, economically feasible presented itself. Okay. So I would like to talk a little bit about rooftop solar adoption in general. <clears throat> Um, and here's a map of the United States. Mm -hmm. There's a pin for you. Um, where do you think people adopt or invest in the most solar? And you can circle that area on the map. It can be more than one area. Well, I have seen lots of people in Florida. Okay. Uh, from my traveling down there, uh, when you get into the subdivisions and areas there, you see a lot of solar. I know also uh, as you ride along the interstate, I-75, there are actually several solar farms okay. uh, that are visible from the interstate. Uh, I would imagine that probably Texas has uh, some investment in solar. I would imagine that Southern California has an investment in solar and probably Hawaii. Those would be my four, uh, okay. best four guesses. Areas. Okay. So what do you think <clears throat> makes those communities so different from the people here in Berrien County? Well, I, there really isn't that much difference if you compare the uh, location on the earth with, say, California and Berrien County because, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're, you're at approximately the same latitude. Um, so uh, as far as the amount of sun, solar rays that you're getting, it should still be direct enough uh, where you're seeing that. It's just for some reason that hasn't caught on maybe culturally or maybe it hasn't it's not, it's not a trend that is picked up in that area 
maybe it has something to do with the legislation in the state of Georgia. I'm okay. not sure. So you kind of mentioned cultural things. Um, then my next question for you is what kind of people live in these communities? Are they, are they different from us? What, what do you think makes that? I'm, I'm not a hundred percent. I know that, uh, there are a lot of retirement communities in Florida and I know a lot of these communities, maybe they're built around a golf course or, so, or, or the, the structures are very similar in, 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 or in, uh, in how they're put together. Uh, but you see a lot more rooftop solar uh, devices uh, in these areas down in Florida. Maybe it's because these people are retired and they have already spent most of their working years working and so now they're living off their retirement income and they have that expendable income that they can use uh, toward lessening their uh, energy bills. Okay. Um, so now that we talk about the United States, here's a um, map of the state of Georgia. And again, circle an area or area that you think residents adopt rooftop solar in Georgia. Uh, man, I, <clears throat> to be honest, I'm, I, I would be extremely unsure. My, my thought would be, uh, if I were to point out, I would probably point out in the lower half of the state, but that would need to be specifically uh, concentrated on urban areas because solar can be expensive. I just don't foresee rural counties having the money available per capita to be able to make a solar investment. Okay. So possibly areas, uh, may, maybe Valdosta, Albany, uh, perhaps Macon, Columbus, Savannah, outside of those cities, okay. Brunswick. All right. I, I'm sure there are people in Atlanta, but I, I don't know to what extent. Okay. So what do you think makes those communities different from us here in Barron County? Money. Money. And what kind of people do you think live in those communities? Uh, the type of people that live in those communities, yes. uh, they are, their, their, their household incomes are higher. And when you have uh, people in a community where their household incomes are higher, then you're going to have a greater likelihood that people are going to have the money to be able to spend on uh, adopting solar energy initiatives uh, on their home dwelling or structure. Okay. All right, so most of your close friends here in Georgia, um, do you know if they have solar energy? Uh, as far as I'm aware, they do not. And why do you think they don't? I think they do not because it's expensive and because it is not something that has been supported by the mainstream in regards to uh, having the solar structures built on the, the house itself. <clears throat> you just don't see much of that. Uh, and until I think it becomes more mainstream, I, I don't think you're going to see you. that change. Okay. All right, so now, if you don't mind, we are going to ask you a few questions regarding the role of food in your day-to-day -day life. Now, if you will, um, tell me about your regular day with food. What do your meals and snacks typically look like? You can break it down to, like, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, I love food, as most people do. Uh, typically, <clears throat> my breakfast includes a pack of blueberry Belveda biscuits because they are delicious and a cup of coffee. Uh, my lunch over the last year and a half has been mainly composed over a high quality peanut butter, a high quality peanut butter and jelly sandwich with <coughs> typically a canned drink beverage such as Coca-Cola. Uh, and then for dinner, it will vary. Uh, some several nights a week, we will eat something at the house that my wife prepares. Sometimes we will go out to eat depending on our schedule. Uh, sometimes it's a quick pickup, sometimes it's a sit down, uh, but that's, that's typically the way the uh, food schedule works. Okay. Some snacks off and on in between, but not a whole lot. Okay. Um, it's kind of interesting. So can you kind of tell me about your go-to meal? Like mine would be steak and potatoes. It's just easy, it's kind of convenient in a way, but it's also, it's just kind of my favorite meal, my go-to meal. If I had one thing I wanted to cook, that would be a steak and potato. Oh, if my go-to meal, uh, I, can I say two? Sure. Well. All right, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> the, pr 
probably the one that would be easier for me. I love a good hamburger on the grill. Okay. Uh, and so I would say a hamburger on the grill would be a great go-to meal. Um, another go-to meal that I like to eat is uh, having fried fish, fresh fish. Um, that's another something I like, but uh, hamburger on the grill, french fries or some type of tater tots maybe, or potato salad, baked beans, that kind of thing. Okay. That's, that's an excellent choice. Probably the burger and, the, and all would be the number one. Okay. Um, so how often do you cook your own meals? Like how many, let's just say how many times a week? Uh, I would probably say the meals in the evening, I'd probably say four times a week. Okay. Are you the only person that makes the decision about the food you purchase in your household? Nope. And who is? My wife. Okay, so do y'all, who purchases the food, who prepares it, things like that? She purchases the vast majority. Okay. She prepares the vast majority, so typically her. Let's see, how often do you purchase food for your household? It can be times per week or per month. Uh, I believe we purchase on average probably once per week. Oh, I actually, I skipped a question. Um, what factors do you think your wife makes when she's thinking about food decisions? Uh, she likes, likes to purchase things in bulk when possible, and so she has more of a long-term approach, mm -hmm. and so we'll do a fair amount of shopping at uh, wholesale clubs whenever possible. And so price is a factor. Uh, and then we try to purchase knowing that, you know, if, if we need to store something for a few months and slowly work on eating it down, then that's okay. Okay. We, we don't make short-term decisions. Gotcha. Okay. So paint this picture for me. Let's say you're taking a trip to purchase food. What does that look like? Taking a trip to purchase food. If it's one of our big runs, a lot of times we go to Sam's Club. Okay. <clears throat> And at Sam's Club, we are all about buying things when they're on the instant savers, the instant savings. And so if they're running a sale on peanut butter, then we purchase a lot of peanut butter. We'll purchase uh, a lot of things that we use at the house uh, at Sam's. Um, the things that we cannot purchase in bulk um, will be purchased either at uh, the Walmart neighborhood market close to our house or a Walmart Supercenter or a grocery store. Um, but so typically a Sam's run is a big bulk run. We'll spend several hundred dollars on things that will be used over a longer period of time. And then the grocery store runs are, it, it's all the other things that, that she's planning on making meals and things over the next couple weeks. So when it comes to feeding you and your family, what are some challenges you face? For example, like for me being gone all the time, convenience and time is a big factor. Um, that comes to feeding my family, like that's a challenge that I face. So if you don't mind telling me about some that you have. An example of a challenge that I face. Well, <clears throat> I think the biggest challenge is to make sure that we provide a variety of meals um, that hit on all the key aspects of meat with protein, fruits and vegetables. We have two children at the house, two boys, and we want to ensure that they are getting as well balanced of a meal as possible. <clears throat> and so I would say the biggest challenge involves making sure that the, the balance of nutrients is there uh, while at the same time keeping the cost as uh, flexible as possible uh, while currently I'm the only person in the household that is uh, actively working and receiving a wage.